alien spacecraft did not crash in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. You know flat earthers, I guarantee it. But you don't know who they are because they're afraid of talking about it. This is your emergency broadcast system. Hello and welcome to the 122nd annual Subliminal Deception Podcast, your weekly dose of conspiracy theory bullshit. My name is Cody. I'm joined by my pal Phil. How are you? Doing good, buddy. How about yourself? Not doing too bad. Um, We need to talk about something. If we want to take a moment to pause for the men who lost their lives during that slaughter of a Minnesota Vikings game last Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Holy fuck, that was bad. How's the hype in Arizona uh, after the first preseason game? Well, uh went to the bar and watched the preseason game, Arizona Cardinals versus the Chicago versus the Dallas Cowboys. Sorry. And basically all of the stars, like Kyler Murray, D Hop, you know, all the all the stars that we wanted to see. We're all on the sideline wearing jackets and hats, no pads. So obviously they weren't going to play. We did get to see Colt McCoy out there Ooh, uh, starting dang. at quarterback. Oh, also we saw our brand new wide receiver uh, straight out of Purdue. Uh, he was very good. Rondell Moore. Okay. Extremely good. Yeah. I have heard uh, people talking about him. Now, here's the interesting thing. I know you don't do not currently have HBO, but... The app, actually, the new episode of Hard Knocks is on tonight. We are recording on a Tuesday, and they are doing the Dallas Cowboys, which means uh, we will get to see an up close and personal look at uh, them playing the Arizona Cardinals and such. Yeah, I actually I used to watch that show back when I had uh, HBO Now, but I haven't watched it in a couple of years. Pretty, so it was pretty good. I remember there was the it was the the Raiders before they were in Vegas. Yeah, when they yep. were still in Oakland and uh, the shit show that that was that year. Dude, uh, with Antonio Brown, who is very yes. clearly on some sort of drug. Yeah, uh, I I actually <laughs> I really really like that show. I find it quite enjoyable. Um, but we had something. We have some prudent information here. We would like to talk to everybody about. Um, so. Phil and I have kind of uh, switched up our how our Patreon is going, and we are now doing trying to do bi-weekly movie reviews, and the last one that we had done was a movie called Lilith, which, okay, it's not going to win any fucking Oscars, but yeah. it was decent. Well, it was my turn to pick a movie, and I found a movie that I think was literally so bad, we can't even do it on our patreon that's how bad it was now it is called uh 2025 i can't remember the rest of the title (laughs) but basically the synopsis is uh essentially the coronavirus has allowed the nwo to take over the world and the nwo i guess eliminated all religion but there's a small sect of christians who are still battling for their religious freedom and they don't want to give up on their belief of God. And it's kind of like the Christians versus the NWO. Um, yes. In woo. four years, somehow all of the religions, all the religions of the world have just vanished and it's just them. It's just these group of plucky, you know, 20, 30 somethings. They're led by in real life. It has to be their cult leader. Yeah. Let's just say he looks like he David their Koresh. cult leader. He looks like David Koresh from yes. the Branch Davidians. Yes, he is a, uh, if David Koresh was kind of like uh, maybe a side character in the Matrix movies, kind of looks like <laughs> one of those dudes, like a street preacher from the 90s. But uh, yeah, they're, I love how they're like all German. And then all of a sudden there's like a U.S. Marine who is very clearly from the South, just yes. as like. Hey, I I love God and I hate the government and I had to quit the Marines because they don't believe in God. And I'm like, (laughs) what the fuck are you talking about? And then they go around spray painting the Jesus fish everywhere. Is like a dog. Is that what a dog whistle would be? Or 
like uh, well, to try to attract other Christians. Yeah, it's kind of like they're tagging it to make it other Christians so that they can know that they're, you know, there's still some Christians around, you know, doing the Lord's work. And they're always like they're hiding their Bibles and, you know, the feds are always after them trying to, you know, trying to disrupt their meetings and take their Bibles. There's a, there's even like an undercover officer that's sent in. It's It was so bad, though. It, <laughs> we couldn't even make fun of it. There just wasn't any meat there. Like, Dude, it's so bad, you can't make fun of it. Um, Here's the thing, though. If anybody feels like watching it, it is on Tubi TV for free. But I promise you, you are going to struggle to get through this fucking movie. It is so... Stupid. The best part of the movie at the end is where they fucking execute the main character. Yes. Best part of the movie. Yeah, I I was sitting down watching that movie, and I I must have started doing like three or four other things. I included like I was so bored, I just started cleaning my apartment out of nowhere, <laughs> just just to do anything besides sit down and watch that. Look, here's the thing, all you single men and women out there. Let's say you got a hot date. You bring them back to your house. You put on that movie, okay? They're going to be so bored of the movie, you're probably going to get laid one way or the other. So maybe it's good for that. Yeah, if she doesn't run out of the room, like, ripping her hair out of her scalp, then, yeah, it might happen for you (laughs) just to get out of that living room. Yeah. Uh, It's just, oh, my God, it is horrific. But anyway, with all that out of the way, we just want to say – If you would want to join our Patreon and start listening to our first movie review, we'll have another one up hopefully middle of next week sometime. That's kind of our goal. Uh, You just go to patreon.com slash subliminal deception. Join at any level and you will have access to that. It is a fun time and thank you everybody who is already supporting us. We really greatly appreciate that. All right, but you know enough about that dirtbag piece of shit movie. Uh, let's uh, let's get into the conspiracy today. All right, well let me dive right in here, Phil. On this week's episode, we are going to be delving into a conspiracy that even normal people might have heard in passing conversation. I have heard several times people mentioning that anyone who has created an alternate energy source that may affect big oil, all of a sudden, mysteriously end up dead. Now, ironically, this conversation had once again popped up at work, and I really wanted to find out if some of these claims have any validity to them, and that brought me to a man by the name of Stanley Allen Meyer. Phil, have you heard of the gentleman named Stanley Allen Meyer? No, uh, I have not actually heard of that, but I have heard of people who have created alternate source of uh, sources of energy uh, winding up dead. I believe the man who created diesel engines and diesel fuel, um, I believe he ended up dead because oh. he wanted to make it out of vegetable oil instead of petroleum. Interesting. Okay, I, uh, th- that's obviously, unfortunately, Stanley Allen Meyer is not that man, but I'm going to be putting that one on my agenda because... Uh, this guy's story is really interesting. Um, so maybe to connect the conspiracy, we'll, I'll have to go into that guy in the future. But uh, Stanley Allen Meyer is the gentleman responsible for a catchphrase that you might have heard that might go something like, I've heard that cars could be ran off of water, but the guy got assassinated, presumably by big oil or possibly even corporate automobile manufacturers. Now, have you heard of this? I feel like I've heard people say, hey, you know, one time there's a fucking guy who made a car that could run off of nothing but water and he wound up dead. Had you had you heard this? Well, I've heard of the, the car that could run off of water from that 70s show. Kind of a reoccurring <laughs> joke when they would smoke weed. So. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember that, but... Uh, yeah. It's interesting they mentioned it because, as we'll find out, uh, this man's story is kind of from the 90s. Okay. So I wonder what they were thinking of. Or maybe they're just like, that's their stoned brain thinking about it. 
Could be. I have no idea where they, you know, where they come up with it. So, right. But possibly there was maybe a guy who said that he had uh, created a car that runs off of water. Maybe that was like a 70s joke or something. I do. I do vividly remember this. I was I had just moved up to the uh, Twin Cities Metro and I was working at Green Mills Pizza and some guy showed up there requesting to purchase or ask if he could have all the used oil from like the deep fryers. Yes. And uh, he had a Volkswagen diesel that he had converted to burn that. Yeah, that was very big in the time after we kind of like after we graduated from high school. I remember I had a job in college where there was a guy who would buy all of the used vegetable oil from the fryers to put in his uh, converted diesel vehicle. Oh, yeah. You know, what's funny. Uh, my dad, actually, his shop runs off used motor oil for mm. heating in the winter. So, OK, getting rid of it somehow anyway. Now, uh, let's begin how we always do. With a brief backstory into the life of Stanley. Stanley Meyer was born on August 24th, 1940. He had a twin brother who was named, Ste- I don't know if it's Stephen or Stephen Meyer. Uh, there isn't a ton of information about his childhood outside of he lived in the great city known as Columbus, Ohio. Uh, okay. <laughs> he stood six foot three inches tall was known to have a loud, booming voice. It was known for being charismatic. Apparently, one of his favorite phrases was, quote, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Now, have you heard this catchphrase before, Phil? No, I have not. But I do wonder if he may have played for the Ohio State Buckeyes. (laughs) Yeah, he was a if he was a six foot Six foot three tall dude, you know, big booming voice. Are they maybe they had him play on there? Are they out of um Columbus? I thought so. Maybe they're they? not. I thought it was Columbus. Okay. But. I honestly, I'm not even sure. I, I really don't know. Um, he d- we'll find out in a second. He actually does attend that college, so oh, we'll okay. get to that in just yeah. a second. Now, to get a general idea of the type of individual that Stanley was. Uh, One time, when he was much older, he called the Grove City Police to come to his home because he had received a suspicious package. The Columbus Bomb Squad ended up detonating that package, only to discover it was equipment that Stanley Meyer had actually (laughs) ordered himself. (laughs) So he's slightly paranoid. Um, a little bit, he yeah. Just a little bit. Oh, can you imagine people, like, everybody orders from fucking Bezos' company. How many yeah. times do you think the bomb squad's been called because of an Amazon package or something? An Amazon package accidentally gets dropped in front of your door. The bomb squad comes, blows it up, and it's just a fucking a big-ass dildo. Just <laughs> blows out of the fucking cardboard. Yeah. They don't say... What uh, was in this package, but they kind of are leaning on that Stanley is slightly paranoid, which kind of clouds, you know, what's going to be happening to him later. So, yeah. Now, before that little whoopsie that he had with the bomb squad, uh, after he graduated high school, he would join the military, although nobody seems to list like what branch he's in okay. um but what we do know is he would then attend as i mentioned phil's favorite big 10 rival ohio state university i believe you're supposed to call it the ohio state university and him you know maybe doing something stupid like calling the bomb squad on his own package maybe it explains kind of like why he went to ohio state you know <laughs> a little surprised he could read was ohio you know, let state alone invented shit was ohio state as good as they are now in se- i would say probably the s- 70s maybe um i do believe they've gone up and down like every single every school has I do think that they were pretty decent during the 70s. I know they had a down period during the 80s, I believe. Well, you remember when Nebraska used to be like the big dick or uh, big dick of the Big Ten, and now 
Uh, they're they're like kind of lingering they, there. They were the big dick of the Big Twelve. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So ever since they've joined the Big Ten, they haven't been very good. Uh, back when they were they were the powerhouse in the Big Twelve North, though. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. But I'm just saying, like all these sports, there's always ebbs and flows. You yeah. Know, to who's good, who's not good, uh, things like that. Now. Naturally, Stanley was a very intelligent man, and he seemed to be quite a skilled inventor. Now, one website, the website called (laughs) buggedspaced.com, okay, uh, claimed that Stanley Allen Meyer, over his time as an inventor, had patented over 200,000 items, which ranged from baking items items uh, that could be used in oceanography or even items uh, pertaining to cardiac monitoring of which we have no idea what any of these items that he created actually were, but they claimed he patented that many items, but another source puts his patents more around like, I don't know, 20 to 30 items. Seems yeah, more reasonable. I'm, I'm guessing it's probably more the latter. Yeah. Of, uh, you know, down there in the, you know, 20s to 30s, just because 200,000 items. I mean, really, I just heard a podcast about Edison, and he used to patent things that he hadn't even invented, just like an idea he'd had. He would invent the idea so that people couldn't, you know, make that later on. And I'm pretty sure he's nowhere near even 200,000 like, scratching the surface at 200,000. So, yeah, yeah. I, he's a pretty prolific, uh, you know, not inventor, yes, but uh, someone who, you know, makes patents. He's pretty prolific at that. So, uh, yeah, I've, we have, we'll have to cover Edison one day because kind of heard, uh, kind of an asshole. Oh, definitely an asshole. Yeah, I do remember our old pal Jimmy Dar though told us the the redneck way of making a patent, which was <laughs> FedExing yourself the idea or the schematics to your invention, and then when someone tries to either steal it or you know like make the patent themselves. Then you just take that FedEx to court. It has the date on it and then you open it up. So I remember that. Why Why go to all that trouble? Why not just yeah. get a patent? Why not just, you know, pay the money and get the patent <laughs> if it's that good of an idea. But it's the, it's the cheap way to do it. You know, the Jimmy wouldn't Dar work. Way. it wouldn't hold up in court for a second. No, it's the Jimmy Dar way. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now the item that would make Stanley uh, really famous or infamous is his invention, the water-powered car. The entire reason that Stanley decided to tackle this project was because of the 1975 Arab oil embargo in which Saudi Arabia was cutting off its oil supply to the United States, causing the price of oil to drastically increase This in turn resulted in some corporations going bankrupt and the demand for new vehicles came to a complete standstill. So Stanley Mm -hmm. figured if he could create a vehicle that completely removed the need for fossil fuels, um, it would, you know, he could kind of eliminate that entire problem as well as eliminating all the pollution that cars, uh, you know, Cause to the atmosphere. So he is the interesting thing about him is even in this time period, he was very aware of greenhouse gases and like, and you know, you know what I'm saying? Like he's worried about the environment and the pl- He knows the pollution that cars are causing. Um, so he decided to start tackling uh, this issue here. So does that ring any bells to you at all? Yes, yeah, the uh, the gas crisis of the 1970s. So basically, um, America was pretty much just producing big gas guzzling, you know, kind of like muscle cars, you know, bigger vehicles. And the gas crisis, there was like long lines outside of gas stations. Uh, the price of gas went from almost nothing to what was considered really expensive at that time. Uh, I remember one time I heard, I think gas was up to like $1.50 a gallon, which gas had barely been like a quarter before then 
You know, yeah. gas was super cheap. And then all of a sudden it was way expensive. This is the same time that a lot of foreign vehicles, a lot of Japanese and Korean vehicles became popular in the U.S. Just because they were a lot smaller. They used a lot ga- less gas. So, yeah, if uh, anybody noticed that all of the vehicles from the 80s are yes. fucking hideous. Uh, this Tiny. Is, yeah. yeah. And, and they're just ugh. This is why, like, the very tail end of the 70s and, like, most of the way through the 80s, vehicles are small, they're supposed to be more fuel efficient, and they look fucking atrocious. It is hilarious when you go to a car show and someone tries to, you know, of course, even even today, they're all still from the 60s and 70s. All those, all those like, the car shows uh, have cars from the 60s and 70s. It is hilarious when someone tries to put, like, a Buick Skylark or something like that from the eighties, like in there, like it's a classic car. Like it's a, you know, like it's a car that people would actually want to see. Like, no, no one wants to see that piece of shit. Your, uh, your first car was kind of a remnant of this. Yeah. That was, uh, that body style and Chevy and see Chevy Buick Oldsmobile. They kind of all made that same body style. Yeah. The total piece of shit. God, yeah. that thing. I, I probably should have died in that thing a couple times, <laughs> especially the way I drove it. I drove the fucking, I drove the wheels off of it, so. <laughs> hey, got you where, you where you needed to go. That's true. All right. Now, some sites claim that Stanley Meyer worked on perfecting his water-powered car over the next 20 years, uh, after which he would display it for the world to see in the wonderful year of 1992. Now, in 1992, if you were one of the lucky ones to have seen the uh, news interview with Stanley Meyer and his uh, little contraption here, what you would have gazed upon is a sweet-looking dune buggy with all sorts of, like, knobs and controllers. Honestly, if if you watch it, um, it kind of reminds you of like the DeLorean almost from Back to the Future. That's kind of how it honestly how his Doom buggy looks. Now you uh, you guys can't see it. You'll probably see it in the Instagram. But Phil, you can kind of see it here. You see that box above the hood there? Yes. That's kind of like it. How can I describe? It looks like a really old computer with like a hundred fucking knobs on it. It looks like the first ever like video game system. Yeah, like when that used to yep. be like a, in a giant box and they would sell it to you for like a thousand dollars and it could barely play Pong. That's exactly what it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine that thing, if you got in an accident, just ejects directly into your chest. <laughs> well, it is on the passenger side, so you probably would be OK. But, You'd be OK. But <laughs> uh, here's the other thing. My other, other favorite thing about this dune buggy, sweet dune buggy, and I don't know why a man of science is like this, but. He, he actually put a sticker there. You can kind of see it. It literally says, Jesus Christ is Lord. And he has yeah. that on both sides of the body there. I don't know why why he did this. Uh, in, the, in the picture here, Stanley, or Phil, Stanley's the guy to the far right. Okay, so Stanley. he's not the guy driving the car. No, no. Oh, okay. That guy's just there uh, for sex appeal. Uh, I I can totally <laughs> see that. It seems like it also, well, you see the American flag, but to the right of the American flag, it says the word solar also. Was it also a solar vehicle? No. I okay. don't know what that that's, is. That's odd. Maybe it's the guy's name. Maybe that's his racing name. They call <laughs> me solar. Maybe something like that. Uh, it, I don't see any solar panels or anything like that on it. So Yeah, I don't. I don't know what the hell that is, honestly. I didn't look to, I didn't really, he also has a number 24, but I don't think he's racing. Must have been a Gordon fan. (laughs) (laughs) Gordon was still a little kid when this, uh, when this shit came out. Or was, was nine, no, 2000s was like Gordon era, right? Uh, ooh, no, it was, uh, he was, he would have been just starting to race like in the nineties, like professionally. He was a, he was basically racing like the little carts when he was a kid. So I actually just watched a documentary about Gordon versus Earnhardt not too long ago. Um, but yeah, he would have been super young right now. So wait, maybe started driving pro, but wait, which Earnhardt intimidator Dale or this? senior senior. Oh, okay. So Jeff killed him. Probably. 
Well, you know, I mean, not officially, <laughs> but there are there are rumblings. It's a lot of DuPont paint on that track that day. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to try to explain uh, how his motor worked as, as best as I possibly can here because it's kind of technical. Um, now, Stanley Meyer had created what was technically called the perpetual motion machine, okay? Uh, yep. The motor worked by effectively splitting water into two its two main components, hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen was then burned, generating uh, an energy source similar to how gas explodes inside of a traditional motor. Now, according to Stanley... The secret to making this work work was Brown's gas, okay? This is interesting because apparently this is considered to be a fringe science, which I didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me, but essentially you, you're taking, you split the oxygen and hydrogen up, right? And then mm-hmm. you create oxyhydrogen at a two-to-one ratio, which apparently... They do that, and that gas is used in torches and welding equipment. So, obviously, if it's used in that, that means that it does generate heat, obviously, right? Yeah, um, I wonder if that's in oxyacetylene. If when, uh, well, you know, what gets pumped through for the oxygen. But I was going to say that you can actually do this. What you do is, so if you have... Um, trying. It's kind of hard to explain, but there are cars that they've retrofitted in the trunk, basically like little bottles of water, and they have electrodes that go into the water. And when you put electricity to those electrodes, it basically separates hydrogen and oxygen. And one's you know heavier than the other. Obviously, hydrogen goes up higher, so they capture the hydrogen, and you can actually put it into your gas tank, and it makes it burn better. Uh, you know, kind of like one of those deals where it's more fuel efficient. Yeah, uh, is the idea behind it. Okay. But yeah, uh, separating hydrogen and oxygen just just takes like electricity and an electrode. Okay, now I want you to remember that because that fact's going to become very, very important later on, Phil. Um, okay. So I think what this, what he's pointing at, from what I could gather, reading it, obviously I'm terrible with chemistry, but it almost sounded like he's splitting it up and then in, instead of like equal parts, it'd be like double hydrogen and a tiny bit of oxygen or something like that. Like rechanging the property of it and okay. then making it more explosive. And also the um, oxygen part of it, uh, it doesn't really do anything from my understanding. It just kind of shoots it out of the exhaust. Um it's kind of what he makes it sound like. It's yeah, kind hydro- of, I think ahead. hydrogen vehicles claim that the only exhaust that they produce is just water droplets that come out of the exhaust. Yeah. Because when, when you burn the hydrogen, it remixes with oxygen, and then it comes out as water. Yeah, so. yeah, basically. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it seemed like a lot of his stuff uh, kind of relies on the natural things in the environment, they get sucked in there with the oxygen as well, or with the hydrogen as well that would help detonate it. So that's kind okay. of interesting. Now, when it was first unveiled, Stanley claimed, this is his claim here, that his engine off of just 22 gallons of water could make it from Los Angeles to New York City. Um, also, you could use regular tap water, you could use salt water, and in the interview, he mentions that he believes it could be fitted to burn up uh, waste chemicals as well. So basically, you're eliminating all toxic. You could use it to like destroy toxic chemicals or sh- and shit like that. Probably put that fucking shit straight into the air, all those fumes. <laughs> I got to say, looking at that vehicle, I wouldn't want to drive down the street in that vehicle, I don't think. It does not look like a comfortable vehicle. Probably not. I think it's uh, lightweight and uh, probably aerodynamic to like maximize <laughs> the little bit of power that it has. 
I gotta say, it doesn't look very aerodynamic with that, you know, with the the windshield and everything. But I will say, yeah, lightweight. I could see that. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it's just a prototype, he's probably just proving that the concept of the engine works, like right, in right. that in that form. I imagine. Like they wouldn't put out a pro like if he had a company, they wouldn't put out a product that looked like that. It probably looked like a normal consumer car, but right. Yeah, definitely. I wouldn't want to drive in that thing. I think, you know, I don't even think that thing has a (laughs) seatbelt. Probably. Honestly, it probably does. And I don't know. They weren't uh, real important in the nineties. Well, here's kind of a little graph of allegedly how this thing works um, or how he claims it works. You can kind of, it's basically kind of what you said, honestly. Mm-hmm. So there's that. I guess you kind of have it, uh, you know, figured out already. I, I'm sure, well, we'll come back. We'll circle back to that because you kind of hit something very, uh, very important there. Now, after he was, after he had shown his water powered doom buggy uh, all over the country, he took it everywhere, showed everybody, uh, it seemed to really be captivating people. And, you know, if this piece of technology worked, like it would have revolutionized the world. Honestly, it would have. It would have taken a long time to get to that point. But if every car was running off salt water, even, uh, that'd be absolutely amazing, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, the salt water, I don't know about salt water, like natural salt water, because you would think it would have to like corrode your engine. Or, you know, corrode because the, the, the exhaust pipes, if it comes out of the exhaust, it would corrode the hell out of the inside of your exhaust. But yeah, um, there are obviously vehicles now that they have, you know, hopefully in the next 10 years, they'll be coming out with them uh, that are fuel cell vehicles, the we, hydrogen vehicles. We're going to be talking about them at the very end. Yeah. So, I mean, it would be, I mean, think of a world, we were, before the show, we were talking about it. Think of a world where Al Gore won the presidency in 2000. Yeah. We might, we might be looking back, be like, oh, remember when like vehicles ran on gasoline, you know, that kind of deal. Yeah, but, I, I was literally telling, talking to people at work. Uh, there is a, somebody I work with who their house is full uh, solar power, right? And I'm like, we have literally a humongous energy source just sitting there in the sky that isn't going to blow up for, I don't rem- remember how many more years before the sun blows up. But uh, we'll be long dead by then, and we just hopefully longer than fifty. Because I only plan, <laughs> <laughs> I only plan on living about 35, 40 is it, more. Isn't it so. like one hundred fifty million more years or something, or is it billion? Oh, no, it's 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 in the billions. Our sun is, um, well, I mean, it's uh, it's in kind of like its main sequence right now. So it's it's like half. It's halfway there to like its whole lifespan. Mm. So it's it's got billions of more years. The only problem is. I mean, by the time it it's going to basically turn into a like a, a big red giant or I can't think of what it's called now. Uh, it basically is going to blow up to past where the asteroid belt is. That's how big it's going to get. Yeah. Well, so, that's yeah. what I mean. It, it'll keep growing. Yeah. Uh, but right yeah. now it's like per- perfect for us in its main right. sequence. So. Right. Exactly. Well, anyway, uh, moving on here now. Even though this sounds like amazing news for Stanley, uh, there is something that is going to haunt him. And it is one of what I would consider a big problem if you're an inventor. American lawsuits. Uh, We know how they haunt people, don't we, Phil? You can't do anything. In America, you cannot do anything without some sort of fucking lawsuit uh, eventually catching up to you, can you? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we actually should try to stay like as small as possible as a you know a podcast, uh, a show, just so that we're not catching any lawsuits. The less people that hear this, the better, I guess. So, <laughs> ah, fuck that. Spread the word. <laughs> now, I'm just kidding. And uh, in 1996, Stanley was being sued by two of his investors who had purchased the right to use his water fuel cell technology in their vehicles. His Hmm. water-powered doom buggy was first set to be examined by Michael Lawton, professor of electrical engineering at Queen Mary University of London, but Stanley continued to push off what the professor would later say were, quote, lame excuses. 
So okay. this isn't a good sign, Stanley. When you're in a lawsuit, you can't be <laughs> not letting people look at your shit, man. Uh, the yeah, especially it makes it look like, especially with the new technology like this, like you've got something to hide. Yeah. Uh, then the court ordered that his vehicle be examined by three expert witnesses who would come back and conclude that, quote, there was nothing revolutionary about the cell at all and that it was simply using conventional electrolysis. So yep. this is just what you mentioned right here. Um, maybe he was, <laughs> pay, I don't know, playing the con man card a little bit here, making it his invention seem more dynamic than it actually was. Uh, kind of yeah, like you I said. Mean, it's the, the idea of just kind of putting an electrode in water and separating out the hydrogen from the oxygen. It's not, you know, revolutionary at all. If, I mean, it'd be great if he did have something. I do believe I've heard of this now, but I mean, it because I've heard of this kind of like it was thought of as a scam, but yeah. it'd be great if he had something like revolutionary that, you know, because he claims that he's, I don't know if he's like spinning the hydrogen and the oxygen to kind of increase the hydrogen level in the chemical. But like if he actually had some invention that gave us like, you know, H2 kind of like brought it together. Right, you know? right. Yeah, uh, I mean, you basically hit it on the head, and he, a lot of people thought he was a huckster, a fraud, and whatever. Well, anyway, because when the experts finally looked at his vehicle, and they brought that information in front of the judge, Stanley Meyer was eventually ordered to repay his investors the $25,000 they had given him. So, I don't, I, we don't really know, but it sounds like a lot of, investors were helping him out this whole time like it's only been four years at this point but it sounds like he was having quite a bit of help financially to keep this thing going jesus 25 grand i hope his grandma was happy to get the money back that's <laughs> i mean it's, i know it's the 1990s but still 25 grand's not a lot of money when you're looking for you know investment that's pretty small amount well i think he did uh, I don't remember what they call it, but where you get like a shitload of littler investments from like a ton of people. Oh, you kind of like the saying? little angel investments, not yeah. the big time, not the big ones, but okay. Gotcha. I th I think that's what he was doing, but I'm not yeah. entirely sure. So the friends and family special, basically <laughs> you get 0.01% of my company when it takes off here. Yeah. Uh, now, after kind of all that was done and over with, Stanley's water doom buggy had ba basically been in display for about six years at that point. Uh, and it's finally time for us to get to the fateful day that kind of is the entire reason that we are talking about this episode today. Mm. The date was March 21st, 1998. Stanley Meyer... And his brother Stefan were meeting with two potential Belgian investors at one of America's best family eateries, the Cracker Barrel. I gotta say, <laughs> it's it's gonna sound redneck of me. And I realize that, you know, I shouldn't say it, but I fucking love the Cracker Barrel. Well, I order I there probably two times a month and get it to go. I don't eat there because I'm not that type of human being. But I get it to go and I like to eat it in my house. It's good food. Look, first off... If you want to impress two Belgian investors, you're taking oh. them to the Cracker Barrel. No questions asked. Um, I Get that chicken fried steak. Yeah, ooh, definitely. That shit's good. I actually really like the Cracker Barrel. They have great breakfast. Mm -hmm. We we have, I think, only one in the entire state of Minnesota. Um, yeah, well, uh, and it's kind of far from here, but uh, it, it's very good. We just had, well, I just had one open a block and a half away from my house. So I go down to that one. Does it double as a senior citizen center as, uh, as ours does? I do believe they play bingo in there every once in a yeah. while. So, yeah. Holy shit. There's a lot of old people yeah. who the love smell the of, Cracker Barrel. The smell of death in the air, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can always find a Cracker Barrel when you see the vultures flying over. <laughs> 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 that's the that's yeah. the old time GPS to find the Cracker Barrel, but uh, but yeah, I'm gonna warn any potential investors in the future of subliminal deception. We will be taking you to the Cracker Barrel to swoon you. 
Oh yeah, definitely. You're gonna get the you're gonna get that great dessert too. It's coming right for you. Uh, all right. Well, the story goes that the uh, all the men were enjoying dinner together. They just raised their glasses and toasted to, I guess, the betterment of humanity. Little oh, corn- noble of them. <laughs> little little weird to have a toast at the Cracker Barrel. Just gonna throw that out there. Uh, Stanley Meyer then took a drink of his cranberry juice and immediately began to clench his throat. He then got up out of his seat and ran out of the restaurant full speed. His brother Stefan chased after him and found that Stanley was now outside vomiting violently. Okay. According to Stefan, the last words that his brother mustered to him before dying was, quote, they poisoned me. Now, um, we know all of that is true. Everything that happened right there is okay. 100% true. So what is your initial feeling after hearing this series of events that just took place right there? Might have been uh, in a run-in with the Putin boys. <laughs> I don't know if Belgian has a, uh, a Russian you know, embassy, but that sounds like a Putin thing to do is poison you at a Cracker Barrel. While you're toasting humanity. Did, uh, they need to be looking around that Cracker Barrel to see if they see a big bear with a hammer <laughs> and sickle hat sitting <laughs> off in the distance. That's an old one we haven't brought up in a while. Yeah. No, yeah. They, uh, a bear just kind of like pretending like it's a stuffed bear, but just kind of like looking around <laughs> for its handiwork. <laughs> this bear died of a cyanide tablet. How the hell did this happen again? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't... Like, when you hear that story in, like, the sequence of events that kind of took place, mm. that's pretty fucking dramatic for him to die that way. I'm just going to say, it like, if think of all the old people that are in the Cracker Barrel. And Stefan, I think who was, like, 56 at the time, runs out the door and he's fucking dead thrown up on the parking lot. Yeah, I mean, the Cracker Barrel is used to seeing, you know... Uh, some carcasses every once in a while. It comes with the, you know, the well, clientele. They, they usually but, don't die outside, though. Yeah, they usually don't die clutching their throat, vomiting out in the parking lot. Normally, it's just very peacefully, like head falling into their soup or something. <laughs> I guess those uh, hash browns really were to die for. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, they got some good sides too. It's, they it's absolutely good. do. Yeah, they um, do. <laughs> Now, this is this is interesting. They didn't release the coroner's report for his death for three months. I, that seems a little funny to me. Yeah. Um, but the coroner's report, when it was released, they concluded that Stanley Allen Meyer had died of a cerebral aneurysm. Again, um, you know, that does happen. That's a freaky thing that can happen to anybody. You usually don't know you have them. Um, Yeah, normally you just kind of have a weird look on your face and you just drop dead, though. Yeah. With a cerebral aneurysm. It's not a whole situation where you take a drink, clutch your throat like you've been poisoned, run outside and vomit and scream, they poisoned me as you're dying. Yeah. I mean, it it, it certainly could be just kind of a weird sequence of events, you know, ironic, coincidental sequence of events, but it just is like, I don't know, it's kind of fucking funny. Um now, obviously, just like you and I, his death left a lot of people wondering. The biggest champion to this whole thing was Stanley's brother, Stefan, who is convinced, he's still convinced, that his brother was murdered. Um, here's a little cherry on top. After the death of Stanley Meyer, those two Belgian <laughs> investors decided to decline his offer after he was dead. They kicked him while he was down, kind of. Yeah. Um, but apparently there is one report that one of the Belgian investors, Felipe Van Mortel, uh, claims that he had actually been financially supporting Stanley for many, many, many years prior to him dying. I don't know if that's true or not, but we know they pulled out immediately after he died. So... Yeah. 
Uh, kind of weird. Maybe they weren't the biggest fans of the Cracker Barrel. I don't really, don't really know, but we know they uh, backed out. Well, hell, I mean, that original pitch for Felipe Vandermutter, they must have taken him to the Cracker Barrel. I bet it worked, you know. You would assume so, but then... I mean, they they financially backed him for six years. That must have been a... Or for years. That must have been a hell of a, you know, Sunday special, the pot roast. Well, here's the thing. If he was already supporting him for years, why would they be meeting again to invest in his... Or buy his plans? I, You know what I'm saying? Like, it, yeah. that, and, that, Unless they were trying to find more investors, possibly. Yeah, that could be. Maybe yeah. Felipe had been in uh, giving him money, and then he introduced him to another Belgian. And I, I don't know. I don't really know. Uh, here's a real question. If you have two Belgians, would they be, would they have been impressed with the waffles that the Cracker Barrel offers? I don't think Belgians are ever impressed with any waffles. No, I it's just like when you when you when you have a Texan and you show them barbecue or show them you know like some fried up you know cow. It's never they're never going to be impressed unless it happens in Texas somehow. <laughs> happening somehow having the charcoal burning in Texas makes it better. It's so. it's all in the air. It's all yep. that uh, cow shit in the air. Definitely, it it's just the there. same with Belgians. They're not going to be impressed with any waffles unless they're. Belgian waffles. They, so. they ain't got that Belgian air. It doesn't nope. work. Now, yep. um, if this was murder, okay, let's say if Stanley Meyer was murdered, uh, who do you believe the potential suspects are? I guess my two mainstays, obviously, that I would believe if he was murdered is the what would be now trillion dollar oil industry. Uh, we know they make an insane amount of money or mm-hmm. maybe even auto manufacturers who make a lot of money off fuel, you know, powered cars. Uh, what what do you think? What do you think about this? Do you think he was murdered? Do you think it was a coincidence? Do you think, you know, somebody out there has a reason to kill people who invent alternate energies? Well, as far as the conspiracy goes, I mean, it is a kind of a big trope of the conspiracy theories for assassinations that the autopsy or the coroner's report is always either changed or different or like really delayed coming out and then doesn't seem correct when it finally does come out. Okay, Um, uh, one sec here. That is a trope. I did not know that was a trope. That's like a common thing. um, of conspiracy theories. There's always fuckery with the oh, coroner's report. Okay. Yeah. I thought it was just in in particular with um the alternate energy deaths. Oh no, I mean conspiracy theories for assassinations. Gotcha. In general. There's always okay. there's always fuckery with the coroner's report, as if someone got to the coroner. If I was an investigator though, I would have to say you'd have to look at Steven first, probably. Just because of, you know, relationship, you know, the closeness to the to the victim but yeah definitely i would wonder who those two belgian people are and who they represent and who may have paid them off i guess if i was looking towards this you think uh you think could they be patsies for a somebody else pulling the levers could have been or it also since it happened at the cracker barrel possibly one of the slightly overweight waitresses who works at the Cracker Barrel, may have just been fed up, just hated seeing just him come in every him. week. <laughs> and that ugly little buggy outside and just poisoned him. These are the fucking Meyer boys. I hate them. <laughs> uh, so, they never leave a tip. Fuck them. <laughs> so, okay, so St- uh, Stefan, his brother, also claims that um, a lot of people over the years had been constantly nagging Stanley to buy out his idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually that's a sign they want to buy it out to destroy it. Yes. Um, he says Stanley fought really hard to like keep that all that shit at bay. And he also claimed that they he was being spied on by different governments. Um, so I don't know how true that second part is. Do you think that would affect the likelihood that somebody did not want this technology to advance forward. 
I know I did hear about, I believe it was an electric car, maybe during the 80s or 90s. And they actually did sell out to a big car manufacturer. And it the the idea or the patents, what you know, whatever, went into mothballs for like 30 years. And they're just starting to come out of mothballs like now in the past decade. So I do know that if, if they buy up the patents on these and if they can get a good lawyer or a good judge, I mean, who's on their side, maybe, maybe a little kickback, they can also get that extended possibly. So okay. get the Walt Disney treatment, <laughs> you know, on uh, like Mickey Mouse. Just keep getting that shit kicked down the road. Is it, Okay, my understanding is legally or technically you can have a patent for, what, 30 years, and then after that you can't patent it again? It becomes uh, like property of the masses, public property. But there are ways you can get around that. You can keep it a lot like to yourself. That's one of the things Disney does. The reason why only Disney's allowed to do like Mickey Mouse or any of kind of like their franchise characters is because they basically have all these lawyers that work on these cases. It should become public domain. That's the word I was thinking of, public domain. But they have really good lawyers and they can fucking kick that shit down the road so that no one else can do like Mickey Mouse, you know, parodies or do anything like that hmm, interesting. Cinderella I if same kind of deal I wonder if that's why South Park could draw Mickey Mouse <laughs> and not get in trouble yeah I have no idea how they did that if they made him look like just a little bit different or if it's because it's a parody if you do a parody I think that's fine like doing a parody of anything but if you would use actual like Mickey Mouse say it's Mickey Mouse doing Mickey Mouse shit then yeah I think you'd be in trouble there Gotcha. Okay. Well, uh, let me round this out here for you. Um, Now, the truth is, like we mentioned, from all I could see, we're not even like we're pretty sure that his invention worked, Mm -hmm. but we don't know if he was a fraud. We don't know if he was a genius. I think he was a very intelligent man, but I think he was kind of disguising his idea as something a lot more simpler or it worked a lot. It was a lot more simpler then he presented it as kind of yeah. like you said, probably had an, an advanced device of basically what you're you're talking about here. Now, but what we do know is, as you kind of alluded to as well, hydrogen fueled cars are in existence today, and they could certainly be the way of the future. Uh, Elon Musk, we all know him, claims this is an exact quote from him that he views hydrogen cars as, quote, mind-bogglingly stupid, which leads me to believe they definitely pose a threat to his very famous business, Tesla, which obviously creates electric cars. What do you think? What do you think Elon could be sweating the future of hydrogen cars a little bit? I mean, here's the thing about Elon Musk. If he thought that they were a great invention that could make him money, and change the world, he would be investing big money in them. So if it was Jeff Bezos or if it was like Chevy or Ford and they said that about hydrogen, I'd be like, oh, fuck, hydrogen's the way of the future. They're just trying to suppress it. If Elon Musk says it, I'm thinking a little bit more like, okay, maybe we should take a second look at this. Now, I can tell you why he believes that they are stupid. It is because that they require fueling stations okay yes. and there is hardly any hydrogen fueling stations i think in the united states there's only one in california that i saw on the map so far i think that's kind of why he believes they're stupid verse obviously there's electricity everywhere um to yeah. refuel his vehicles now you can buy one of these hydrogen cars right now today, if you want, uh, there is a 2021 Toyota. I think it's Miri uh, that's listed at about fifty thousand dollars as a base, which honestly is not that bad because most cars nowadays that is like the base for just oh. about any car. If you tried to buy a pickup truck right now, like 2021 brand new. $50,000 would be a steal. Like, grab it, because that's yeah. cheap right now for yeah. a truck. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, here's the interesting thing. Gets 67 city miles per gallon and 64 highway miles per gallon. 
That's fucking phenomenal. Yeah, definitely. Also, I did hear about a concept for hydrogen fueling stations. So what they want to do is they're basically going to have a station that's completely self-reliant. It's not going to be like a gas station like we know it now. Uh, basically, it's going to be just large tanks of water along with like kind of a small solar farm outside of it. And it would make it would just generate the hydrogen all day. Basically, it would use the energy that it creates to split the oxygen and the hydrogen from the water and basically just make hydrogen for the vehicles and then uh, let oxygen out into the air. Damn, that would be fucking awesome if they did that. Yeah, that's their idea, basically, for hydrogen. Um, I have no idea, like, if that is possible, but it'd be a really good idea if it's you know, if it is possible and feasible. That'd be a great thing of the future kind of deal. The problem is you do have people in the coal industry who think that hydrogen fuel is a great idea only because they want to basically um, – like like melt down coal and like re- have the hydrogen released from it, and that's how we would get our hydrogen is from coal. They think that's a great idea, of course, because it involves coal. So, oh, god damn it! Uh, Which you can imagine what happens to the waste from that coal. It yeah, just, you know, of course, ends up in a you know some lake or river somewhere. So, yeah, I hate to say sludge. it. I I've heard some. It's probably an episode I'm gonna do in the future. Um. I've heard, I've been hearing even local to kind of where we are, the Mm -hmm. places where 3M factories were maybe like 20, 30 years ago that are no longer there, that they're pretty sure they poison the water. Weird thing, (laughs) kids, the the kids, uh, an abnormally high amount of them are now developing cancers um, in certain regions, which is terrifying, but uh, that's for another episode. Um, now, the, finally, this Toyota, uh, if you were to get to the vehicle, it causes, like Phil's kind of mentioned, zero emissions. Zero emissions. And when you fill it up, you can drive 402 miles. That's awesome. Uh, so, yeah, this, uh, and it doesn't look that bad either. kind of just looks like a Toyota Camry, if I'm being honest with you. but Or no, Toyota, yeah, yeah Toyota Camry. You do have to remember, too, that those vehicles, they do also need to use oil to lubricate all of the, you know, the parts and everything. Um, All of the moving parts inside the engine still are going to need oil, but it's not like you're burning that oil. You know, it's just basically you're going to have to dump it eventually, which is bad for the environment. But it's a lot better than, you know, burning all of that, you know, all those tons of uh, emissions all the carbon dioxide and all the bad shit that gets into the air. Here's the thing. Hydrocarbons and whatnot. Here's the thing. We figured out how to properly, you know, how to dispose of oil. So that's not that big of a deal as long as people are not pouring it into the ground. Um, (laughs) 90s style. (laughs) Yeah. Thankfully, most people aren't that stupid anymore. But, you know, this is America. Um, It's so... Or maybe they could find some other way of lubricating it. I don't know. Uh, I, I I really don't know. But how do you how do you feel if you? I mean, it'll be a while before we can get these alternate energy vehicles. But mm. I'm all for it. I don't. How are you feeling? Yeah, I'd be all for hydrogen. Um, it's it's one of those situations where if they would have started really looking into this. 30 years ago started really instead of just trying the oil industry, you know, big oil, just trying to get the last little, you know, suck of the teat that they've been trying to get for however long, you know, holding all these renewable energies down. If we could have just, you know, switched to hydrogen and, you know, Elon Musk wants to move everything to electric. He's done really good things for like research into making like better and longer lasting and, you know, batteries that are just awesome like you can have a battery that pretty much runs your whole house now uh, along with the the solar uh, there's they make like roof tiles that are solar that basically get all of that you know energy that's uh, what into I've that heard. big tesla batter yep, battery that's what i've heard uh i haven't seen them i've seen like only the older ones but uh yeah that's pretty it's pretty awesome 
I was going to say, though, the problem with those batteries is they use a lot of what are called like rare earth elements or like rare earth minerals. Lithium and those stuff. are those are like very it's it's very hard to get. Uh, there aren't a lot of places that have them. Afghanistan's actually one of the places that has a lot of like this rare earth mineral that is like key to making like our modern cell phone batteries and modern Tesla batteries. So really like the whole, you know, pollution, like damage to the environment, like our footprint doesn't, the bad thing about using those batteries is it doesn't go down as much as we would like just because of how hard it is like to make those batteries. But yeah, I mean, it's a step in the direction that we want to go. I think hydrogen though, if we can get the refueling stations, if we can get the science and the, you know, manufacturer, if we can get all of that figured out, I think in, you know, 50 years, really would help out the earth also you know hopefully there isn't 15 billion motherfuckers running around the planet you know no matter right what then. if we have that many people the whole fucking thing you know the, it's jenga everything just falls down hopefully <laughs> we can get that under control get it below 8 billion okay final comments here phil do you think yes or no stanley meyer was assassinated yes you think he was, but I don't think it was some, I don't know. Like it doesn't, it's just a little weird. Like him, like surreal, the end, like the aneurysm, but he like runs around, goes outside, vomits and immediately says, I've been poisoned. You know, it's a little weird. And then the coroner's report like that long after it's, it's a little odd to me. I don't know who would kill him. Maybe it's like an investor that he fucked over. If he was a shyster, if he was a flim flam man and he was, screwing these investors out of money. Maybe it's one of these investors, possibly that man who had been supporting him for years. Right. Felipe Vandermoodle. Vandermoodle sounds like he might be a guy who knows some assassins. <laughs> here's so, what here's what I can say German. from my like amateur years with true crime. Um sometimes when people are murdered, it doesn't have to be this big elaborate shadow government. Sometimes they're usually killed by somebody who's like really close to you. So, uh, yeah, it, it's he could have ripped somebody off. Somebody could be mad. It, like Phil said, money makes people do crazy shit. OK, yeah, that's why I said Stephen was, you know, suspect number one, because he's the closest person to him. He was there when he died at the table. You know, that's kind of who the cops would like look at first. Right. Right. So I don't know. I kind of think he was murdered, too. But I don't know if it's necessarily to silence him in this fashion. But I'm definitely looking forward to looking into other ones in the future. Anyway, Phil, um, I hope you enjoyed the episode. If anybody wants to give their opinions on what happened to Stanley Meyer, how can they get a hold of us, Phil? Well, they can hit us up on our email, subliminaldpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, we've been getting a lot of uh, great messages. We've also been getting some weird messages from some HR people trying to have you know some uh, some guests on. So that's a little weird. We didn't expect that to happen. But you know, it, uh, it's uh, great to hear from everybody. Also, probably even better way to get a hold of us, Instagram, Subliminal Deception Podcast on IG. Uh, go ahead, you know, follow us. Figure out, you know, you know, we talk all the time about how we have pictures from the episode in those posts. So if you want to see those pictures, just go ahead and look there. They're all saved and archived. Uh, Cody and I both have our own Instagram accounts. Mine is sdpodphil. I never check it and haven't done for a year now. Cody, you got one? Yeah, follow my personal Instagram at Cody Zabub. I post memes and stuff sometimes. It is fun. Uh, the last thing we need you guys to do is to log on to iTunes, leave the show five star review. Doesn't really matter what you say, just type "Hail Tesla." I don't care. Uh, <laughs> if you are a Spotify user, all you have to do is hit the follow button, and it is allegedly like a iTunes is like their version of a review. It will shoot us up the uh, the old ratings there and help us reach more followers. Otherwise, guys, I hope you enjoyed this uh, this episode here, learning a little bit about alternate energies and possibly a man who was murdered. Oh, See? also, also, I wanted to say our buddy Lee is starting a new podcast. Good luck. When I find out the name of that podcast, I'll tell you guys about it. All right. There we go. Shout out Lee. All right. We'll see you guys next week.
Thanks, guys.